Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another of our Lockdown Learning free business continuity webinars. Before we begin, I'd just like to say if any of you have any topics that you'd like to be covered in future webinars, please get in touch as we'd love to hear from you so we can try and cover these in the future. So today's webinar is on battling the COVID-19 infodemic and is presented by pandemic planning expert and managing director of Glen Abbott, David Hutchison. We'll have a short Q&A section at the end of the session. If you'd like to ask David any questions, you just need to type in the question box on the control panel to the right of your screen. You'll receive a recording of the webinar later on today in case you missed any of the session. So I think we're ready to begin and I'll hand you over to David. Thanks, Lachlan. Um, morning, everybody. Um, what I'm going to do is do a, a slightly different version of what I said. Originally, the, the nice people at BC Training gave me half an hour and they, they've stretched that to an hour. So what I'm going to do is cover some other subjects as well further on through. But the first section is as, as we originally said, it's about fake news. I, I do apologize for the use of the word infodemic, but when you're setting these things up, it, it, your mind goes blank when you're asked for a title and you just type that in. So what, I, what I'm going to do is just cover some of the things that affect everybody in, in the nonsense that we hear. But this first slide, just as a matter of interest for you, um, a lot of people ask me, how, how did we end up with this thing called coronavirus? You know, where did that come from? And you see the red letters there, and they explain where COVID-2019 became corona, or coronavirus disease 2019 became COVID-19. The reason behind that was partly news related, because if you think back to the other pandemics going further back, there was the Spanish flu of the 1919, 1918 one that I think most folk have heard of. There have been plenty before that. There was in the late 1800s, there was a Russian flu. We've had the Hong Kong flu. We've had various others. And you see that they've always been named after a country or a location. Now, the Spanish flu didn't start in Spain. There's no reason to think that, but for some reason, Spain got kind of tagged into it. And the choice of making this COVID-19 rather than Chinese flu or Wuhan flu was to really take away the, the kind of the association of the name of a location or a country with a disease. and. This, this is just a generic name. But the quote that I've got on there from Dr. Tedros, the DG of the World Health Organization, is kind of what started me down the route of doing this talk. And this, he's, he's made it clear, and they spend a lot of time fighting misinformation, and so does the UK government, for those of you who are in the UK, just dealing with the fact that the assets are trying to, to that is dealing with a way of fighting the fear and the rumour and the stigma and the nonsense that comes around it. And part of what I want to do this morning is just give you the chance to fight back against it. You know, if you're in, a, in an organisation, you're maybe getting these rumours. One of the things I'm doing quite often at the moment is kind of providing a, a, an almost a rumour checking source for some companies where they get things in and the staff are worried about it, and I do my best to, to put the rumour to bed if I can. And it's just interesting what comes up. And I just thought what I would I would do was show you some of these. Now, Sherlock Holmes is one of my heroes of literature, and this came from uh, a scandal in Bohemia, which I'm sure some of you have read. And it just kind of sums it up in the you know, if you get a theory and you think, I want that to work, and you've got some facts, you just move the facts around until they fit. 
and that kind of that kind of sets the story up that I've got some facts and I've got a theory. They may contradict each other, but as long as I word them in just the right way, I might just manage to get them to fit together. And then I've proved it, of course, because I've got facts. So that's it. We're all sorted. We've got it proved. Thanks very much. So what I want to do is, first of all, just dispelling the myths and the fake stories. Now, I could spend days telling you the stuff that I see on this, but I thought I would try and pick some of the big ones and some of the more weird and wonderful ones so that you can have a look at them. Now, the thing about fake news is to get fake news to work, there are, there are actually criteria to make it work. I mean, you can have the, the insane fake news. I'll try to think of one, but, you know, suppose I've decided that I'm going to tell you that there's a way of preventing COVID-19. You can prevent yourself from getting it by shaving your head, painting it green, and sticking a ferret down your trousers. Now, a well-known way of preventing COVID-19. So there you go. That, that's, I've said it, you know, so is it fake news? Well, I've told you it's true, so it's up to you whether you believe it or not. Now, the kind of, the problem with that, of course, is that it doesn't entirely work as, as some degree of truth in it, because the vast majority of people with any degree of sanity will look at that and go, what? We'll ignore that one. That, that one doesn't count. And yes, there's going to be a small minority somewhere in the world who end up with dermatitis on their skull and some very nasty bites on some sensitive areas of their body. But to be honest, they won't be a loss to humanity. But for most people, to make fake news work, there are criteria that you need to kind of build into it to give it that just that bit of credibility. It's got to have some kind of credibility. And in COVID-19, the favorite one is that it came from a nurse, a doctor, a consultant, a professor, all these, these unnamed people in these professions that have come up with this story. But that gives it just, uh, it may be true because it did come from one of these groups, did it? Well, they're never named, but anyway, there they go. It needs to be someone from far away. That helps. So if they're based in China or Malaysia, or Vietnam, Singapore, doesn't matter where. If they're local, you might actually find them. You might check that if they exist, but if they're from far away, there's no way to check that sort of stuff. So that gives it again just that little bit of something that, well, maybe, maybe, you know, the Far East are ahead of us in this. They, they've had more experience of it. They might be learning something we don't know. Yeah, okay, that, that might work. And it needs to be something you can do or something you can get. You know, aliens landing doesn't help in this. It needs to be something viable for you. So, you know, this doctor in Malaysia has said that She's discovered that if she feeds stewed plums to somebody three times a day, the virus disappears. And you think, oh, yeah, well, I, I can get plums. I wonder if that works. I'm not keen on stewed plums, but, well, yeah, maybe, maybe that might work. And it needs to be scientific. So it's not just this doctor has said that, that plums work, because that's just fruit. Oh, no, because plums contain this chemical Chlorogenic acid. I don't know if it does. I made that up. But anyway, um, well, it must be true because it contains a chemical. So, yeah, we're all the way now. We've, we've solved the problem. And the result of that, panic buying of plums. There you go. So, that's how to build fake news. That's how it's done. Because rather than somebody sticking a ferret down the trousers, you've built a story with enough threads in it to make think, make folk think, is it? Is it really? And then you see it loads of times and volume adds. The more folk who share this nonsense, the more you think, well, I didn't really believe it, but look who's sharing it. Look how many folk are sharing it. You know, tens of thousands. They can't all be wrong. So maybe the plans work. 
And by the way, I don't know if they do, so don't believe it, please. Now, this is one, I think it's, it's probably about the most common one. And if you look at it, it pretty much meets the criteria. Well, see, most of you, I'm sure, have seen this one. You know, it's from Stanford Hospital Board. There is no such thing. That the coronavirus, yes, they've got it. Now, the lung is usually 50% fibrosis and it's too late. Oh, well, you know, they, there's somebody from a medical background using a medical term. Fibrosis has nothing at all to do with coronavirus. But that doesn't matter. This is fake news. Oh, and they're in Taiwan. Even better. <laughs> they're a long way away. So there you go. And then they tell you it's easy because all you need to do is hold your breath for 10 seconds. And if you can do that, you don't have it. Utter, complete nonsense. And followed by that, drink water every 15 minutes. A few sips of water. Now, drinking water is good for you. <laughs> and given that my, <laughs> my throat is dry at the moment, I will do exactly that. <laughs> of course, it's good for you. Rehydration is a good thing. The problem is <clears throat> that drinking water every 15 minutes doesn't have any effect whatsoever on coronavirus. So if you've seen that one, ignore it. It's complete and utter rubbish. Now, the one that we see most at the moment is that the 5G network is spreading it. And you've just got to think, it's one of the favorite conspiracy theory ones, this. But you think about it. First of all, coronavirus is that, just that. It's a virus. It's spread by droplets from somebody who coughs or sneezes or whatever. It doesn't travel through your mobile phone. It doesn't travel through the network. It's biologically impossible. But folks start to believe it. And to be honest, I'm, I'm up in the north of Scotland. Now, you know, we, we don't have 4G, as I say there. You know, we've got, still got two tin cans and a bit of wet string and bits of the highlands. But we've got cases, so shows it's rubbish. Where this one might have come from, I did a bit of digging into it, is there is some pictures online of some people in China knocking down what is described as a 5G mask. A 5G mast. They are, but what they're knocking it down for is not because it's 5G. They're knocking it down because it was being used as a spy camera. So it's sort of true in that it might well be a mask, but it was knocked down, nothing to do with coronavirus, and it was ages ago. So, you know, that's how you can take a story and take bits of it and turn it into a fact. And to be honest, the main thing about this, if the government are doing it at all, it's just to try and find people who are dumb enough to believe it. So I think that's where the 5G one came from. And really again just step back for a second and think that is it possible no of course it's not possible so i thought i would do a kind of timeline of the nonsense which is always that helps a wee bit this one again has had a lot of traction that health experts in america said it would kill 65 million people this is way before it ever was announced. So they must have known it was coming. Well, no, um, it was part of a test exercise that was done in the USA. Now, in Glen Abbott, we ran lots of pandemic exercises way back 2007 and 8, with similar UK numbers so we could test the worst that could happen. It was not based on we knew it was coming. We just we test because we work with organizations that need to test the worst that could happen. And that was all that was happening. It, it was an organization called the CDC in the USA that did this, and they do it regularly. And another thing, the CDC, they, they'd said that they found it in toilet paper. Well, that might stop the panic buying of toilet paper if we find that out. 
but the fact about it was it was on a junk news website. The, the trouble with some of these junk news websites is they don't make it clear that they are spoof websites. There's really good funny ones in the UK, the Daily Mash news stuff. I used one of the news stuff once for that last one about the 5G stuff. But they make it very clear that that's what they are. There are quite a few of these sites who don't make it so clear. And then we get the ones that people look at it and think, that's on a news website. I must put it on the internet because it must be true. Yes, well, as long as you can still walk unaided and breathe on your own, that's probably fine. Just keep it at that level. Um, now, that, again, another one, the, oh, the bioweapon one, that's all over in all sorts of versions. A Chinese intelligence officer revealed it. Well, knowing what things are like in China, would that really happen? It's not a great career move if you're a Chinese intelligence officer to tell the world that you've developed a bioweapon. Let's just think that one through. It was on a website called UFO Spotlight. So, um, just how trustworthy is a new site? Is that? Maybe it is the aliens, of course. Maybe that is what's doing all this, but never know. Um, so that's that was where it all came from. That's coronavirus clearly wasn't just found in bats and spread to humans, as many viruses have done. Oh no, it came from all these weird and wonderful things. But the things that can stop it, you know, now that it's here, of course, we can't do anything about it, so we need to stop it. And for some reason, garlic has become a real favourite. Now, any fruit and veg is great for you. You know, we should all do the five a day and all the rest of it. That's great. Garlic has no special properties. Ice cream. And this relates to this one and the next one, heat. Some folks are saying, oh, you must not eat anything cold, not ice cream, not have ice cubes in your drink, because if the body gets cold, that helps the virus. And the alternative, have hot baths, because if your body gets hot, that prevents the virus. Neither of these make a line bit of difference. There is question about how well the virus would cope in the extreme ends of temperatures, you know, maybe above 25 degrees centigrade or below 4 degrees centigrade. There, there are variances happen there, but your body doesn't actually change that much. Your body core temperature moves very little. So things that you do to it won't actually change it that much, and they won't affect it in any way. Now, I came across this one, drinking some sort of silver uh, product that you put in water. That's just dangerous nonsense. Cow urine. Um, yes, well, we'll not go into that in any great detail. I haven't tried it, and it doesn't matter how many of you are online and ask me, I'm not going to, so don't bother. Vodka. Now, the thing about it is we kind of conflate two things here, because we probably all have seen the hand gels, which needs to be 60% alcohol to work. And then you conflate that with, well, if we use this brand of vodka, that would do. Well, you know, those of you who might be online who know me would know that I have used vodka in the past, but possibly not for this kind of purpose. The thing about it is the vodka that you buy is about 40% strength. To be effective as an agent against coronavirus, it needs to be 60%. So trying to make hand gels or whatever out of vodka, it's not going to work because it's not enough. And another one, just it, I saw this morning that Listerine, you know, the, the mouthwash, was saying that that has more of alcohol and vodka, so that will help. Well, actually, it doesn't. It's got about 25, 27% vodka, uh, alcohol, so it's actually less. So it doesn't actually help in the slightest. So, you know, forget that one. You can use vodka for medicinal purposes if you really want, but certainly not for this. And lemon juice, well, vitamin C is good for you, and it is used under certain circumstances, but not for this purpose. So don't don't bother with that one. It, 
it is good for you, but the body will only ingest a certain amount of vitamin C and then it actually has to put it back out again because it can't use it. Now, the conspiracy theories, uh, these are wonderful ones, we see them everywhere. That President Obama sold the virus to the Chinese in at some un, unnamed point so they would experiment with it. Well, again, just think what that says. The Americans would sell a bioweapon to the Chinese. Right. Yeah, that's good thinking. And also another minor problem with this one, Barack Obama left in January 2017. This appeared in almost 29, almost 2020, late 2019. Bit of a gap there, but yeah, we'll not bother because to be honest, the amount of conspiracy theories about Obama leave, you know, I could spend days telling you those. Don't know how we'd have time to be present if he'd done all of those things that he's supposed to have done. I think not. Um, and then that this virus was designed to only attack humans. And that was quite a common one for a while. It's kind of been, oh, and of course, it's about thinning the herd. That's the Illuminati, obviously, are in charge of the whole world. And presumably, they're listening in and have got all their names on this call. So that's us. Kind of. And I actually saw Roseanne Barr, if any of you remember her, she, she has a bit of a a track record on conspiracy theories. She's saying today that this is being done to thin out the baby boomer generation. Uh, yes, right. Um, managing to get breast neurons still. Uh, so it does all those things and it's attacking humans. Well, there's a lot of bats in China who might point out that we had it first. And there's the odd tiger and there's a Pomeranian dog in Hong Kong. And I think there's a German Shepherd in Germany. So, no, it does. It does. It came from bats. It's 98% common to, to a bat virus. Bats carry massive amounts of virus. That's why they're very dangerous animals to be anywhere near. Are they an animal? I can't remember. They're very dangerous to be near if you're handling with the bite. You, they, they carry an awful lot of things. Oh, and this one. There's a railroad wagon in the States carrying COVID-19. There you go. Look, says it is. Well, first of all, look at the size of that truck and imagine how small COVID-19 virus is. It would take an awful long time to fill that truck with them. And then you're making a biological weapon. So, you know, you're on the same level as Blofeld in the, the James Bond movies. And what do you do? You put the name of it on the side of a truck. Right. That's really, really useful. That's hiding it, isn't it? Have I heard of Photoshop? Now, the next thing I want to do is a bit about the prophecies, because we all knew this was going to happen. Actually, an awful lot of us did know something was going to happen. We just didn't know exactly what. So the favorite is that Nostradamus predicted it. There you go. He said all these things, you know, it, they all tie in. Look at it, year, Corona, comes from the East, be a plague, seven hills in Italy. I've been to Italy, they've got more than seven hills. I think they mean Rome, but anyway, stretch a point there. Uh, it'll be a twilight of men. Well, actually, that isn't sexist, but I'll come to the point to prove that actually men are more at risk. Never mind that. And it would be the end of the world economy as you know it. Now, Nostradamus, died around about 1500, I can't remember the exact date, it was around about 1500. To be honest, I'm not sure that he had a great view on the world economy as in at about 1500. I think he might not exactly have been able to spot where we are now. And he didn't say it at all. It isn't in Le Profiteers, it's not there, but it's a favorite. Nostradamus has predicted everything that's ever happened. It's always said it was him. And actually, they're very hard to understand at the best of times, and he certainly didn't predict this one. Uh, this is an interesting one. Dean Koontz, the novel, predicted it. Well, um, 
that's not as easy. He did sort of. Originally, it was called Gorky 400, and it was a, a Russian virus. And then at some point, I think in the 80s or something like that, it became Wuhan 400, which is very close. But the thing about it is it killed 100% of those infected, and it developed in four hours. So although there's some similarity, in, and a lot of people knew that Wuhan had several uh, labs working on, on viruses, and one of them is authorized to work on the most dangerous you get. So it's a reasonable choice to make. Um, so if you, if you look at that, did he predict it? Well, he doesn't say he did. It's a bit closer to the film Contagion than, than what we're dealing with now. But again, it's easy to make it sound like that was the truth. And The Simpsons. And of course, The Simpsons predicted everything. And actually, I have to say, they are pretty good at it, The Simpsons. And this is one that I used way back in 2007, because The Simpsons predicted in 1993 a thing called the Osaka flu. And in 2007, 8, 9, as we prepared for the swine flu one, we used that. I, I remember doing talks like this with the Simpsons in it. But the one that you're seeing going around now where they have coronavirus, it's a Photoshop. They've, cha they've changed it to make it fit the current status. So again, although the Simpsons were very good at prophesying things, I don't think they got this one. And a few general ones. Bill Gates's positive message. He didn't say it at all. It seems like it was written by a guy in London. He didn't attribute it to, to Bill Gates. He wrote it, and somehow in the way that it got twisted, Bill Gates got hold or got named for it. In the UK, the NHS staff are being mugged for their uh, passes to get into the supermarkets. Well, again, the Met Police said, news to us. Complete nonsense. But these are the sort of things that you're seeing. And if you want to try and kind of fight these things, go on to the World Health Organization website, who.int, and that's got a Mythbuster section. And you can see some of them here. You can download these posters. It's a really good source of how to fight this nonsense. And a few more have seen antibiotics. No antibiotics don't work because this is not a, uh, a bacteria, it's a virus. Favourite one again, that. Wearing rubber gloves. Uh, well, yes and no. The problem is with gloves and with masks is that as soon as you try to take them off, unless you're really an expert and know exactly what to do and how to dispose of them, the chances are you're going to touch the virus if it's on these things, and then you're going to touch your face, and then you've undone all the good. So it doesn't help. And reputational damage. Uh, again, this was one that said that the Corona beer had dropped, I don't know, it was, what was the figure? It was some 129 million pound loss because folk wouldn't buy it because it was called Corona. Again, this is where it's a wee bit of truth and a lot of nonsense. The company, who, I think it's Interberf, is it? Uh, one of the biggest drugs, uh, drugs companies in the world own Corona, along with vast numbers of others. Because most of the world is in lockdown, their sales have plummeted. Not because Corona might drink, be, you drink it and you might get the coronavirus. It's been done because, it, you know, they drop in sales because, well, people are not out drinking it. They might be drinking it at home, but there's still a drop. So, again, it's a bit of truth mixed with a bit of nonsense, and it becomes a fact. And, no, they didn't change the label to Ebola to save the damage. But the thing to do, beware of the media. Ah, the media, the wonderful people. In the UK, we're lucky we have got a free media. They can print what they like within reason. And that's that's a good thing. I mean, uh, you know, we, we 
are lucky that we have that, but they don't have to go over the top. This is just from one or two things that I've picked up over the, the last few weeks. Uh, you know, what's the saying? One in 10 Britons would end up in hospital. That's around about 6 million people. Now, however the NHS was funded, there are not 6 million beds available. And morgues in Hyde Park, well, there's a wee bit of truth in that. But this, again, was part of the overall planning way back 2007 and 8. What would we do if it became serious? You have to have morgues. Does it matter that they're in Hyde Park? They've got to be somewhere, and you need an open space to build them. And this one, oh yeah, it's a medieval plague. No, it's not. The Black Death was a medieval plague, which killed almost everybody who got it. This is not a medieval plague. It's an unpleasant disease which is causing deaths, but let's just try and keep it in some perspective. And this is my favourite, a terrifying chart. Oh, we're gone then, that's it, we're done for now. Terrifying chart, that tells you all you need to know. The thing about anybody who's ever done graphs for a presentation, we all know that the real trick is to decide the scale you use. If you want it to show how bad things are, you make the scale wide and the chart rockets up. If you want to hide it, you make the this, this scale really small and it barely rises. There you go. So terrifying, may, well, depends what you're counting it against. And this one, uh, the virus may kill more men than women. That, funnily enough, and not funny in, in at least half the population's case, is true. You might wonder, but it is true. And why? Well, it's happened before. The other ones we've had, SARS and MERS, the death rate amongst men was higher. There's two reasons we think is the case. One is that the female immune system is different from the male immune system. And that may be, and I don't think anybody really knows because it's impossible to find a way to test this. It may be because that immune system is passed on to the fetus and it's designed in a different way. So that may be a reason. And the other is, to be honest, that men's uh, hygiene behaviours are frankly not as good as women's by and large. They don't wash their hands as often or as well. They also have a tendency to smoke more, drink more, and just have poorer diets. So overall, men are more likely to suffer uh, fatalities out of this for all of those reasons. It does kind of suggest that man flu is a possibility, so keep that in mind. Um, so that's that's what I want to cover on the myth side of it. Now, I think rather than take questions just now, if we maybe hang on to them. If you get any new ones or any that you think, have you seen that one? My email address is on there, so you can send me them and I'll um, have a bit of fun trying to find out if I can, if I can see what they are then that's that always helped me uh let's see this has been shared with some friend of mine uh so i'll i'll pick that one up at the end um i'll just try and be able to see the screen a wee bit clearer so I'll, I'll cover that one first now the next couple of things i want to do are a bit more serious just to give you some background and some information on things that you can use that may help explain things to you. There's a great deal in the UK at the moment about testing. Now, it, that will be happening all around, to be honest, but uh, I just wanted to maybe just a slide to, to explain a little bit about tests. Again, it's, it's just moving on a bit from where we were. The two kinds of tests, the swab test, which I think we've all seen the pictures of a, a health service or some medical person leaning in a car window taking a swab on a cotton bud. That is the molecular test. That swab is then taken away and it's tested. And that takes a bit of time to do. And that will tell you if you have got the virus. What it won't tell you is if you've had the virus and it's now gone. So it's useful to say where you are now. It doesn't tell you if you've got any kind of 
past history or immunity. That's what an antibody test or serological test does. That looks for immunity in the blood, and that's the one that certainly in the UK the government are trying to find one that works. So we can say if you've had it, there's a reasonably good chance you get immunity, and therefore you'll you'll be okay. You know you can go back to work, you can do all these sort of things. The problem is that we're struggling to get a, a test that works. The the two main makers of the, of the test claim I think one claims 96%, one claims 98% accuracy, but it need, there needs to be enough antibodies in your system and your blood supply to, for the test to work. So if you've had a mild case of it, you probably won't show. And also, I've also heard that it could take, if you've had a mild case, it can take two weeks for the test to, to work in terms of you've got enough of the antibodies. So that's the problem we've got at the moment. The idea, once they get one that works, is they would be available from folk like Amazon and Boots, so you could buy it and test yourself. And they're a bit like, I think, maybe a, a diabetes test. It's a blood prick on your finger, and that's what's analysed. So that's the difference between the two types of tests. And the problem at the moment is the antibody tests are just not proving accurate enough to be used with enough confidence to say we're okay. Now, um, this might sound as a depressing thing to, to talk about, but I just want to put the fatalities in a little bit perspective. Everyone is a tragedy. But I'm not for one second playing down anything about that, but we have to remember that in most weeks in England and Wales alone, over 10,000 people die from something. So we just need to keep some degree of perspective in this. And we're still seeing the vast majority of people who die are in the high risk groups or over 75, especially over 85. Those are the, the ones who are, are showing the highest level of fatality and that's what we expected it to be. And often the COVID-19 is not the only cause. It's one of the causes within that group of people. And when this is all over and we look back on it, the fatality rate is probably more likely to be around 1%. Because at the moment, we're not counting anybody who's had the illness and not reported it. I mean, I, I know somebody who's had it. And they weren't that ill and they didn't get medical advice. So they don't appear. So we, we know the number of fatalities, that number is fairly easy to calculate. But what we don't know is the number to divide it by, which is how many people have actually had it. And that's why the true fatality rate might well be lower. And just again, a wee bit about the Imperial College model. We, we spend most of our days in Glen Abbott at the moment doing model preparation for organizations to try and predict when they will have peaks and how we can do it. We use NHS numbers and we use Imperial College numbers, we use other people's numbers to do that kind of modeling. It can be quite complex and quite specific. But this, this just again, it explains why the, the high peak that you see, the, the no suppression model, that in effect is the herd immunity model where we do nothing, all the population go around, an awful lot of people get it, and then most folk have got immunity, which sounds good until the point that you realize that a lot of those people who got it in that high peak would have got it at the same time. And they would, some of them, quite a number, would have been very ill, and there would have been no way in the world the NHS could have treated them. So they moved to the second one, the suppression model, which does definitely suggest that there will be a second wave as we lift the the lockdowns in the UK and everywhere else. Because a lot of people being locked down haven't got it, and when they go back out, they might still get it. When will that be the second wave? We're, we're modeling it at 
probably late, mid to late September at the moment, but that could change. And just a bit about mental health. Now, I, I am not in any way qualified to make statements or talk about. I just want to raise a few points. You know, it's it's not something I've got any training in or a great deal of knowledge in. So do treat it in that respect. But this just came from the NHS. It's just it's remembering that you need to look after your mental health, and also that this is problem where we're all going through the lockdown and everything else. But remember, it will pass. It is temporary. It's not a permanent future. And just accepting that these things happen, that you know, in the lockdown that we have in the UK and most other places, I'm sure you, wherever you are, you're probably going through something of that kind. All these things are there, they, they affect you, they cause stress. You worry about people who Maybe you you think you're not at high risk and you're probably not, but you know somebody who might be, so you worry about them. And there is this this constant underlying worry that that kind of eats away at you. And even more so if you live alone, because then you don't have the same access to people to be able to say, Oh, can't be that bad, is it? Or we'll be okay. It, it's not as easy. So you just need to keep in mind that there are people who might be in that position. And you know, having a chat with them online is good. And I, I think it's a good idea to use webcams. A kind of remote chat as we're doing now, that's fine when there's a hundred odd people online and you know, you really don't want a webcam in me, frankly. But you've got enough problems to deal with without that this morning vision. But you know, if you're chatting to a friend, try and see if you can use the camera. It does make a difference. It just makes it that more personal. So those are the sort of things you can do. And some things that you can do to help, and I know this, you know, some of this comes from the World Health Organization, from the NHS, from other sources. The news is almost entirely negative. We'll all see, you know, if you look at the BBC News, which, you know, it is is trustworthy to a very large extent. But half or more than half the news bulletin is about coronavirus. And the good news stories, apart from maybe the applause on the Thursday night for the NHS, are virtually nil. So if you watch it all the time, you're going to only see the negative. And don't watch the late ones and then go to bed because it will be in your mind. Do only look for trusted sources. You know, all the stuff that I said at the start, all the nonsense, ignore it. Stick to sources that you can trust. The World Health Organization, yeah, I trust the BBC by and large, and I think they do, they do their best in that. Other sources, the NHS. It doesn't mean that you're weak. If you're worried about it and stressed by it, don't feel that, that you're, you're a problem because of that. No, you're not. We all have a degree of that. I, mean, I do this every day, all day, and I can deal with it, but not everybody does. If it's, if it's something that makes you think you're, you're different, no, you're not. You're like other people. And keep off social media. I, I now don't look at Twitter at all because it's, it's just full of bile and nonsense. And if you know that somebody is always the one who spreads all these stupid stories, block them for a while. Don't, don't let them do it to you. And this is a technique, I'm not going to go through it because again, as I say, I'm not in any way qualified to do it, but I just, I thought I would put it on the presentation so that people can see it. It came from Anxiety UK. I'd never heard of the Apple technique, but when you read through it, and you know, I won't do it just now, just to, to let us get some questions, but you know, you do that and you think, actually, that's just what you need to do. Just Pause for a minute and just think about what this is about. It is a bad illness, but for the vast majority of people, we'll be fine afterwards. And if you're working from home, again, it's it sounds great, and I did a lot of work on this in the early days, helping companies prepare for working from home. Because what we've said is, if you're not used to working from home, the first week is good fun. You know, you, you can 
do whatever you want. You can potter about, you can wear what you want, you can speak to the dog, you can make tea when you want, eat when you want, all these sort of things. But then as time goes on, if you're not used to that kind of life, it becomes isolating and it becomes lonely. So companies who have a lot of home workers have got a real duty to support the mental health of those people. Don't just assume that because they're sitting at home doing their job, they're just the same as they would have been in the office. That's a very dangerous approach to take. Because you know, if, if you get your boss tells you off for something, at, at work you can speak to your pals about it and round about you and call them names and it's all fine. If you're sitting at home, you don't have that ability to, to unload some of the pressure. So you just, if you have home workers or you're working at home with others, just try and keep in touch and don't make every day work and nothing else. That's dangerous. And just make sure that communications go out and don't try and be the BBC. If you're sending out communications from your organisation, make it about your organisation, about people, you know, somebody's had a baby, somebody's I don't know, that whatever they, they've got an award for something, it doesn't matter, they've got to help the NHS, it doesn't matter what it is, but keep it personal rather than the BBC. There's plenty of folk can find their own news online, keep it low level. And if you are home working, which I am, uh, I, I just, I've been saying to people, try and treat it as a working day. I mean, I get up at the usual time, and I'm at work at the usual time, even if I've travelled oh, about five metres to achieve that, it doesn't matter. Um, I try to make it my working day. I've got times where I stop, times where I'm at work. Except there'll be distractions. You know, you, that's, you're at home, things are going to happen. It's not the same. You know, and uh, anybody who's been on, I, I, did, I did one a couple of weeks ago, and um, a spaniel joined me and it was on video cam so the spaniel replaced my head as he sat on my knee while I tried to talk and sound sensible and could hear the whole place disintegrating laughing at me. These things happen. Just yeah fine. It's a bit of a laugh. Carry on. Except there'll be distractions. Yes do make sure you take exercise and another important thing and it doesn't matter whether you're the employer doing this or whether you're the employee dealing with it have a switch off time. I've been saying to organisations, you should say that maybe, I don't know, seven o'clock, eight o'clock. After that, you don't send emails. Because otherwise, you're at home with your laptop. You're never actually away. It's there, it's waiting for you. You know, you get an email on your phone, you think, oh, I better go and have a quick look at that and I'll deal with it. And suddenly it's nine, it's ten at night, and you've gone to bed with your mind full of work and you don't sleep well. I think it's a good plan just to say, no, I stop work at whatever time. And after that, I'll look at emails tomorrow. If it's critical, yes, you can phone me, but otherwise, I'm off work. And it just stops you being at work and nothing else. And it's good coming from me, as some of you will know, but even I'm trying to do a bit of that. Not perfectly, but I'm trying. And as I say, don't feel guilty about distractions, really, because. There's Logan helping me on a conference call recently. Um, he doesn't feel, it doesn't seem that he's fully engaged in this. I have to say he, he appears to be somewhat dozy at the time, but then, you know, conference calls can be a long thing, but yeah, he's helping, so that's fine. So don't worry about it. If these things happen, just accept it, have a laugh and carry on. And that's really all I wanted to cover. It's what about 10 to 11 now. So we've got 10 minutes if anybody wants to ask any questions. If you want to contact me, that's my email address. I rarely use Twitter. You can get me on LinkedIn. I'm in there either as the company Glenn Abbott or as myself. You can find me in there. So if you want to ask me anything or get in touch, please do. And in terms of questions, Let's see if I can find the one that this, there's one there with a link. Uh, uh, um, let's see if I can make the screen a bit bigger. And 
just so I can I can see it because I'm I'm old and struggle to read. Uh, right, uh, we're all using Teams, Zoom, all these things. Will it encourage mainstream society to treat these as the kind of the way forward? Will we stick with it when this is over? Uh, I think I think there will be. I think there will be a time when this is over. We will see more homeworking. But do I think that there will be a huge change? I'm not convinced that there will be a huge change. I still think that a lot of things will go back to the way they were. It'd be nice if more was being changed, but I don't think it will. I really think that we, we'll, we'll still carry on working the way we were. Um, children sending in artwork and handled by the media. Everybody's struggling with this. I mean, the, you know, the, you have to remember that the media, bad news sells, and the media will look at, at a story from, sadly, in most cases, how can I turn this into a good headline that isn't good news? So, Anything that involves, at the moment, the NHS and children are good stories to put, even if what they're doing is bad news that they're putting up. Um, there's one or two there. Um, uh, there's a link in it. Unfortunately, I can't check the link at the moment, but I will check that one and get back to Swain. Yes, I saw that. Uh, it's said to have originated from a, a an animal market in Wuhan. Has this been independently verified? Well, Peter, um, no, it, it hasn't. What we can say is that the, the genetic makeup of COVID-19 is 98% similar to that that has been found in bats in China. Is that proof? Not 100% because it's only 98%. It's very likely that that is the case. It's very, very similar to that virus in bats. And bats have a kind of a sink. They carry a lot of viruses. They're, they are a dangerous animal. Are they an animal? I have no idea if they're an animal. But can we say that it's absolutely proved? No. But it seems the most likely, given that most of the viruses that we've seen over the years did come from a, some sort of animal source. So I would say, as likely as not, yes. Um, number of deaths, uh, I'll just see if I can, I can expand that one, which is only those, um, I can't see the rest of the question, that one, um, about the deaths. The, the death numbers, certainly in the UK, the, there are probably three sources, and they're all slightly different because they all count different things and at different times. So the actual figures, uh, the if you take things like the register of birth, deaths, and marriages, that's usually between three and five days behind because they need to go through the registration process. So that one's later. A lot of the deaths we're hearing about are only those that come from a hospital because they're reporting it and therefore not in the wider society. So are any of them wrong? They're not wrong. They're right for the specific information that they are reporting. The final source will always be the register of birth, deaths and marriages. And that is always just because these things take time. There's a lag in before you actually get the information coming through. Uh, Will the lockdown ever be lifted without the the vaccine or a test? I think it has to be. I think what they will do is they will start to lift it in a partial form. They will, first of all, they will lift it in some ways, but they will not lift social distancing. So we may allow people in some jobs to go back to work, but they will insist that we retain the two meter distancing, social social distancing. I think that's what we're going to do. That's the only way that we can start to bring things back. Will there be a vaccine? I 
think we may see one before the end of the year, if not, then possibly early next year. The reason we're not rushing a vaccine out is because the disease is not killing the numbers that it might. If this was like Ebola, which kills 80% of those folk who get it, there's a desperate need to get a vaccine, and they would release it with little or no testing, just to do anything. You would, and you would take it without testing because you've got an 80% chance of dying. You would, the risk is, is worth it. This isn't that way. It's by far the other way around. So releasing an untested vaccine may do more harm than good. So that's why vaccines will take time. I think the lockdown will be partially lifted. The schools will start to go back probably after the holiday period. But we will be asked to retain social distancing. And that was to try and keep the numbers in the graph down, to try and keep it below the level that the NHS can cope with. Uh, time lag between number of cases and levels of separation. It does seem to be working, but it, there's about a 10 day, 10 time lag between these sort of things to be able to, to show that it's working. And I know that, you know, there's a huge rise in other violence, domestic violence, child abuse. It's who would be a politician, really? You have on one hand, if you let people go out in the, the wider population, they may die from the virus. If you keep them locked down, they're going to be getting issues with crime, child abuse, domestic violence. There is no right answer. Really, it, they must try to reduce the lockdown as soon as they think it's viable to do that. But they know that the lockdown is causing other problems. And it's balancing one against the other. Not easy to do, and I'm glad I don't have to do it. Uh, will it keep people used? Will uh, I mentioned about will we stick with this sort of stuff uh, using template, using online media? Yeah, I hope so. We we would like to save the planet a wee bit by less travelling. Um, the tiger that got the symptoms, should we worry about the animals? No. They have got, you have to be careful, I don't think they've got the symptoms. They have been shown to have some evidence of the virus in their body. None yet have really shown symptoms or the absolute mildest of symptoms. So the animals, I think, are entirely safe. Could we catch it from them? Um, no. Yes, from bats, from a cat. Not from the fact that the cat's got it. You may get it if the cat was somewhere and was stroked by somebody who had the virus and then you stroked the cat when they came home. Yeah, there's a possibility there. But the animals themselves, no. I think that, that isn't really a problem that, that we, we face as far as we can see. The danger is it's on the, on the fur and you stroke it and you could get that way. So always, if you touch an animal, wash your hands, definitely. And washing your hands is still the best thing you can do. What will change when the lockdown is lifted? Um, oh, and somebody said a bat's a mammal. Thank you for that. Um, yes, shows my knowledge of these things is limited. Uh, will things change when, it's lift, when the lockdown is lifted? Yes, some things will change. I think in time, by and large, we will be back to the way we were. Humans do that sort of things. They revert. I think that uh, there were, it's something that I, I was talking to Lachlan and the folk this morning about doing uh, another talk, maybe in a few weeks' time, about what will it be like afterwards and how should we prepare for the return. So that's something that I do intend to do, and I'll be working on that. Yeah. Excellent. I do know it's a mammal now, Andy, so thank you for that. Now I've learned something from today if nobody else has. Um, the testing, um, is, is, is it hiding the number of deaths or the lack of testing? Is it hiding the number of deaths in some countries? Yeah, probably. I think an awful lot more people have got the virus than we know and probably a number of people have died of the virus that we don't know about in some countries. Yes, 
that that is just fact i'm afraid or sorry i can't say it's a fact it's it's my strong belief that there are a lot of people who have had it of what they call asymptomatic might even not know they've had it uh, are they hiding the deaths not in the uk certainly not in the usa not in in a number of countries in some and i don't want to name them yeah i think i think the number of deaths are higher than than we believe quite considerably higher in some cases and just a myth about that one that there's a story going around that seven million mobile phones in China have become disconnected, and the story is that that's because seven million people have died and they're not able to use their phone anymore. Now there may be a grain of truth in that, but the other side of it is that business in China collapsed, and a lot of these phones were business phones, so they simply weren't used because there wasn't any phone. So again little bit of truth maybe and a lot of speculation so that that's one that i've seen quite a lot um would it be safer if everybody went out with some type of mask uh masks so uh, i didn't do that anybody who's been on any of mine before no masks is one of my favorite subjects um i know the usa are saying you should make masks out of t-shirts and these sort of things their effectiveness is not going to be great I, I believe that masks are only useful if you're in the medical profession or if you're close to somebody who has the disease. Masks, unless you can get the, the FFP3, the very expensive and high level ones that are respiratory masks, first of all, why have you got one of those? If you've got one, you should give it to a hospital. If you're using the lower level ones, N95s, or lower level even than that, First of all, you're going to need two or three a day, every day for the next 12 to 15 weeks. Where are you going to get them? And even then, you shouldn't have it. If you're, if you're not unwell and you're not working closely with somebody who has the disease, you should be giving those masks to the medical profession. I don't think masks make a great deal of difference at all. I think they will not help most people. Um, now, I can't see some... I'm trying to see if, uh, will it will it increase willingness of companies to spend money on business continuity management? I think the opposite, Leonard, unfortunately, for all of us. I think a lot of them will say, we don't need to do exercises. We've been through a real scenario. We managed it. Look at this. We've done it. Are we going to spend more on it? I don't think we will. So I'm afraid it's likely that the may there will be cutbacks. You know, the economy is being destroyed in places by this. There's going to be less money in firms. And as ever, business continuity will be one of the things I think that takes a hit. I'm fairly sure that will be the case. Now, I'm just conscious that we're just past 11 o'clock. So I think we probably need to finish at that point because the, the webinar is just time to run for an hour. We get slightly way, but other than that, I think all I can say is thank you all very much for listening to me and rabbiting on for an hour. If you've got any queries or anything else, my email address was in there. So please just send it along and I'll do my best to answer it uh, as soon as I can. And again, just stay safe, stay in and look after yourselves. Thanks very much, folks. Um, yeah, great. Uh, thank you very much, David. That was uh, really interesting, informative, and definitely entertaining. Um, until you until you answered the last question, which made us all feel all the, those that work in business continuity management a bit depressed. But um, that's great. I'm, I'm I'm sure we'll disagree with you on that one, and hopefully, people will be spending more money on business continuity management services in the future. Um, Anyway, so thank you also to everyone else attending, listening, and uh, asking questions. As I mentioned earlier, you'll receive a recording of the webinar later today, in case you missed out on any of the content covered. Um, all webinar recordings will also be away available on our website. We're just in the process of scheduling further webinars, and a list of these will be available on our website once final details have been confirmed. Um, I'd definitely like to have David back again um, as, a, as a presenter because it's been really interesting. Thank you for that. 
Um, and thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you on the next webinar. Thank you.